Hello, I'm doing a movie review, and the movie I want to review is the 1986 science fiction drama slash body horror film, The Fly, which I have on VHS. Now, this is a remake of the 1958 film of the same name, which itself was based on a short story by George Langlin, which was published in Playboy magazine in 1957. The movie also takes some elements from the 1915 short story the Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. Now, the 1958 version of The Fly had two sequels, Return of the Fly in 1959 and Curse of the Fly in 1965. Now, me and my friend Jeremy recently reviewed the original Fly trilogy, and you could go check out those reviews if you want. Now, my friend Jeremy will be showing up in this video later on to give his thoughts on this movie. Now, the original screenplay for this film was written by Charles Edward Pogue, who would go on to write Psycho 3 and Dragonheart. Now, Pogue brought the script to Mel Brooks, of all people. The same Mel Brooks who directed films like Young Frankenstein, High Anxiety, and Blazing Saddles. And it was his production company, Brooks Films, that financed the movie. Now, it was producer Stuart Cornfield who suggested David Cronenberg as the director. Now, Cronenberg at this point had directed films like Shivers, Rabid, The Brood, Scanners, Videodrome, and The Stephen King adaptation, The Dead Zone, and Cronenberg would go on to direct movies like Dead Ringers, Naked Lunch, Crash, A History of Violence, and many others. Now, Cronenberg rewrote Charles Pogue's original script, and despite the fact that what Cronenberg wrote was actually quite different than what Pogue originally wrote, it was Cronenberg who insisted that they both get equal screenwriting credit. Now, David Cronenberg, I really do think, is one of the most important and unique filmmakers, not just in the horror genre, but in any genre. And to quote a podcast called Geek Juice Radio, in their episode on David Cronenberg's movies, one of them said that Cronenberg's work is going to be studied and analyzed long after he's gone, and I definitely agree with that. Now, I definitely think you could consider The Fly to be Cronenberg's first mainstream film. At least it was his first mainstream hit, because a lot of the movies he did prior to this were more underground and a lot of the movies he did before this actually didn't do too well when they first came out, but had since developed cult followings. But this movie, on the other hand, was a huge critical and commercial hit when it came out, and even won an Academy Award. But I will say, because this is Cronenberg going mainstream, it deals with a lot of the same themes that he touched upon in his earlier work, but it does feel somewhat watered down compared to his earlier work, especially compared to something like Videodrome. But it also shows you how great of a filmmaker Cronenberg is, where even if he is making something a little more palatable for a mainstream audience, it's still no less amazing and still no less powerful. Because there's still a lot of themes in this movie to discuss and analyze, and there are a lot of themes in this film that are pure Cronenberg. Now, you could almost consider The Fly to be sort of an amalgamation of something like Videodrome, where it is a story about how technology is affecting and changing us, and something like The Dead Zone, where it's very much a drama and a tragic love story. The Fly also manages to do something that very few remakes, especially horror remakes, are able to do. It actually overshadows and outshines the original film. This movie also fits in with sort of a trend that was going on in the late 70s and throughout the 80s, where different filmmakers were remaking classic horror films from the 1950s. Like you had Philip Kaufman's remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers from 1978, which also had Jeff Goldblum in it. You also had John Carpenter's The Thing and Chuck Russell's remake of The Blob. And again, I think this movie definitely fits in with that series of remakes. 
Now, what the plot of The Fly is, it begins where this journalist named Veronica, or Ronnie, is interviewing people at this Meet the Press event held by this company where the scientists who work there can speak to journalists about what they're working on, and she meets this eccentric young scientist named Seth Brundle, who claims that he has an invention that's going to change the world as we know it. She, of course, doesn't take this very seriously, because everybody there is saying something like that, but he convinces her to go back to his place, and he shows her that he has created a machine that can actually break things down on a molecular level in one place, and then reconstruct them in another place. Basically, he has invented a teleportation device. So, as a journalist, Ronnie starts documenting Seth's experiments with this machine, and he wants to test it out on living things. But throughout the movie, they start to fall in love with each other. But one night, Seth mistakenly thinks that Ronnie is cheating on him with her old boyfriend, so he gets drunk and decides to test the machine out on himself, something that he probably wouldn't have done, or at least he would have been more careful if he was in the right frame of mind, but he tests it on himself, and unbeknownst to him, a fly gets into the machine with him. But because the computer that controls this teleportation device was only programmed to transport one genetic pattern, it gets confused when the fly gets in there and decides to splice Seth's genetic pattern with that of the fly's. But Seth comes out on the other end feeling perfectly fine, but he doesn't realize that his atoms and DNA have literally been merged with that of a fly, and throughout the course of the film, he slowly starts to mutate into something else. And Ronnie can do nothing but watch in horror as this person that she loves is changing both physically and mentally into a creature that never really existed before. Now, what the film stars Jeff Goldblum as Seth Brundle, and it is an amazing performance, because he starts off the movie so charming and so likable, which makes his slow and painful transformation into Brundlefly, as he calls himself, all the more heartbreaking. And I liked how even when his body is literally starting to break down and he's starting to metamorphosize into this creature, he still has kind of a sense of humor about it, which partly is because he is going insane, but you also kind of get the idea that he's still trying to maintain sort of an optimistic mindset even when it's clear that all hope is lost, which is a very relatable thing. And the movie really showcases what a trooper Jeff Gold Bloom is that he was able to sit through those long hours in that heavy makeup and was able to act through that makeup, and he never complained, apparently. And apparently when he was in the full body makeup, he couldn't go to the bathroom. It shows you how committed to the craft he really was. And Stephen Dupli's makeup effects combined with Chris Wallace's special effects is amazing, and they definitely deserved the Oscar they won for this. Because it's so realistic, it doesn't look like makeup effects. It looks like we're actually watching a man slowly transform before our eyes. In the film, Gina Davis plays Veronica, and she also does a great job, and her and Jeff Goldblum have great chemistry together, which might come from the fact that they actually were dating at the time. And they both have these quirky personalities that makes them so likable and so relatable, which again makes what happens in the film all the more tragic. You also have John Gitz as Ronnie's boss slash ex-boyfriend, Stathis, and he is such a creep in this movie. In the beginning, he outright stalks her. And you get the idea that when they were dating, it probably was an abusive relationship to some degree. Or at least very toxic, because Stathis is an asshole. For all intents and purposes, he is sort of the antagonist for the first half of the movie. But he's also a three-dimensional human being, and despite the fact that their relationship is very toxic, he's also shown to genuinely care for her and genuinely care about her situation. 
And by the end, he kind of becomes the hero in a weird way. And that's a very Cronenberg thing to do, I think. Taking this sleazebag and making him ostensibly the hero of the film. And I liked how, to one degree or another, the three protagonists of the film are socially broken people. Like, Seth, you could already tell, even though he is very charming, you could tell he's kind of a socially awkward guy, and probably hasn't had a lot of close friendships or relationships during his life. And Ronnie kind of seems to be the same way. It doesn't seem like she has a lot of close friends and family, which is probably why she keeps going back to Stathis for help despite what a dick he is. And Stathis clearly has some problems of his own, so I liked how the film is really about a love triangle between these three fundamentally broken individuals. Now, what Leslie Carlson, who played one of the villains in Videodrome, has a small role in this movie as an abortion doctor. And David Cronenberg has a brief cameo in the film as a gynecologist in what is revealed to be a dream sequence and is probably the film's most famous a scene where Ronnie gives birth to a giant maggot. Another unique thing about The Fly is it's a monster film where the horror does not come from the monster itself, rather the horror is in watching this man slowly become a monster. And when Seth's metamorphosis first starts, there's sort of a debate on whether or not it's contagious, and there's actually sort of a debate on whether Ronnie should even go anywhere near him. And some critics have read this as a thinly veiled metaphor for the AIDS epidemic. Because keep in mind, in the 80s, AIDS was just discovered, and very little was actually known about the disease, and unfortunately there was a lot of prejudice against victims of the illness. But you could also look at what's happening in the Seth in the movie as a metaphor for not just AIDS, but cancer as well, or any sort of terminal illness, and really the film is about the horror of watching a loved one slowly succumb to a terminal illness. Although Cronenberg has said that the film is actually a metaphor for death in general, how everybody we know is eventually going to die, how we are eventually all going to die. And Cronenberg had a very interesting quote about death. He said, We've all got the disease. The disease of being finite. Death is the basis of all horror. Another interesting theme that the movie touches on, and this is a theme that runs all throughout Cronenberg's work, especially Videodrome, is how is technology affecting us, and how is technology both changing us as a society and as a species? Because when you think about it, everything that's happening to Brundle in the film is happening because of a computer glitch. A fly got into the machine, and the computer got confused and spliced Brundle's DNA with that of the flies. And basically, the computer literally changed his flesh. And by the end of the film, his flesh merges with the machine. And something this movie does really well is it really analyzes the concept of teleportation, I would say even more so than the original The Fly. And it also explores the existential questions of teleportation. And that's actually an issue I have with Star Trek, because in Star Trek, teleportation is such a normalized thing that nobody really questions it. And this movie really shows how horrifying that concept can be, especially if something goes wrong. Because you're literally being torn apart atom by atom and then reconstructed somewhere else as if you're nothing more than a computer program. And a really important scene that I think often gets overlooked in this movie is the scene where Seth gets a steak and then cuts it in two, and then he transports the other half of the steak, and then he gives Ronnie part of the steak that wasn't transported, and she says, oh, it tastes fine. And then he gives her the steak that was transported, and she's like, it tastes synthetic. To show that this really isn't the same steak that was just put in the teleportation device, this is a copy of the steak. This is the computer's interpretation of the steak. So that begs the question, when Seth went through the telepod, 
was what came out on the other end really him, or was it just a copy of him, and was the original Seth killed, and this new Seth simply has the memories of the old Seth? And when he starts to fully become Brundlefly, he says, I am the offspring of Seth Brundle and the Fly. So he acknowledges that Seth Brundle and the Fly that went in with him are dead, and what came out is a new creature. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the film does take some elements from the Franz Kafka novella, The Metamorphosis, which is a story about a man who wakes up one morning to find he has been transformed into a giant cockroach. And in that story, his family ends up turning on him, not so much because he's turned into a giant bug, but because he can't provide for them anymore. And the whole story was really about how anybody who doesn't provide for the system is basically just an insect to the system. And in this movie, you don't necessarily get that, at least not to the same degree, but you do have a man who's literally turned into an insect by his work, and by the very end of the film, he literally becomes one with his work. And it's this whole idea of what happens when a man becomes nothing more than his work. And one of the most heartbreaking moments in this film is a scene where Brundlefly tells Ronnie, I am an insect who dreamt he was a man and loved it, but the dream is over. Now, it would be a sin not to mention Howard Shore's amazing score for this movie. But yeah, The Fly is a great movie, it's a great horror film, it's a great science fiction film, and it's also a really good drama as well. And while I don't hold it up on the same level as something like Videodrome, it does definitely deserve to be considered one of David Cronenberg's best films. Now, The Fly had a sequel in 1989 called The Fly 2. Now, I don't know how well that did financially, but I know critically it was considered to be kind of a disappointment. But that one did end up developing a cult following of its own. There was also a comic book series called The Fly Outbreak, which picked up where The Fly 2 left off. And in 2008, there was actually an opera based on this movie, which is just bizarre to me, but David Cronenberg actually did direct the first production of the opera. And a few years ago, David Cronenberg actually did express interest in doing another sequel to The Fly, which I would love to see what he would do with this story all these years later. But at this point, it's probably not going to happen, although I have heard that David Cronenberg's son is doing some really interesting work, so why not give the project to his son? Now, before I end this video, I want to cut to my friends Jeremy, Christian Feliciano, and John, given their thoughts on David Cronenberg's The Fly. The Fly is, in my opinion, one of the most grotesque, disgusting movies I've ever seen. And I mean that in a good way. I also consider it to be one of the best remakes of all time, since it takes the concept of the original and expands on it in a fresh, new way that makes it even more disturbing. This is definitely a perfect example of a great body horror film. You know, the original was a body horror film as well, but... You know, this one t definitely takes it up a terrifying notch. It follows the same basic plot of the original, in which a scientist creates a teleportation device and tests it on himself, only to discover too late that a fly was with him in the machine, causing him to mutate into a human-fly hybrid monster. In the original, the transformation seemed to happen all at once, and, you know, he had a fly's head and a fly's arm, whereas in the remake, the transformation happens in different stages over time. And in my opinion, it's even more horrifying than the original since you see how his body deteriorates over time. As the film goes on, he just gets worse and worse and he loses more and more of his humanity. And I gotta say, the makeup effects designed by Chris Wallace are fantastic and very well detailed. And I commend Jeff Goldblum for having the patience to sit in the makeup chair for all those hours and, you know, have all that stuff glued onto him. He's great to watch in this movie, and I think that he has this natural quirkiness that's good for the role of Seth Brundle. I had the great pleasure of meeting him back in 2015 at the stage door for The Late Show with David Letterman, and he was very pleasant, and also delightfully odd. I got a photo with him, and he was also nice enough to sign a photo of him in Jurassic Park for me. 
I must say, it was a very cold night waiting for him, but it was well worth it. I also really liked Gina Davis and John Getz in this movie. Uh, I think that Gina Davis does a great job showing that her character can stand up for herself, and John Getz plays a perfect asshole. There's this one scene where he confronts her about her relationship with Seth Rundle, and she says, I'm on to something big, something huge, and he just bluntly goes, his cock. <laughs> Oh, that part always cracks me up. I also want to point out that this movie was produced by Mel Brooks, who's mainly known for being a comedic legend, and he kept his name off of the movie because he felt that if people saw his name in the credits, they would be expecting a comedy. I had the great honor of meeting Mel Brooks at his Broadway show back in 2019, and I uh, was lucky enough to get a photo with him and two photos and a poster signed by him. Uh, it was just an absolute thrill to meet him, and it was an experience I'll never forget. Another thing I want to mention about this movie is the musical score by Howard Shore. It's perfectly tragic, and the effect of him climbing over the walls is also pretty impressive. Uh, they did that with a rotating set. Same thing with Tina's death scene in A Nightmare on Elm Street. The final look of Brundlefly is just incredibly terrifying and is definitely the stuff nightmares are made of <sighs> anyway i'll wrap it up here if you haven't seen this movie then i definitely recommend checking it out especially if you've already seen the original 1958 version of the fly take care everyone david cronenberg is a master of horror he knows how to take body horror specifically and make it disturb you because body horror, a lot of times, it could be very silly or it could come off as you're trying too hard. You know what I mean? When you're, when you're trying to just gross people out, it could come off as, oh, you know, the guy's not really that creative. He just is trying to just, you know, gross you out and, to, you know, that's not really horror. No, David Cronenberg knows how to disturb you really uh, badly with body horror he knows how to make things stick with you and give you nightmares just based on what the human body can do if it's put under a really weird and strange uh, circumstance like in the fly we get to see jeff goldblum go through so many changes that it is truly horrifying to look at we see his fingernails fall off we see his body parts falling off we see him becoming this whole other creature and it's horrifying to look at it and it's this really corny concept, if you really think about it, because the guy gets into a teleportation system, uh, a fly gets in there, and the DNA connects with a fly. Like, that just sounds really, really corny. Like, you would never think that that would work, um, because that is an old concept that's from the original film, and the original film was done when science fiction was still pretty new, so it was, you know, just them testing the waters of what they can do to horrify people but he really took that concept and made it just so crazy and it, and it made it so scary and you just really just don't want to teleport ever like i look at nightcrawler and i'm like dude please never be like near a mosquito or something that's horrifying um i don't know how you know he does it in x-men but that's just yeah that's horrifying um, when it comes to the fly, though, like, it's, it's, it's also a creature that just, you're like, it's a fly. Like, flies are not really that dangerous, you don't, you know, whatever. But he takes that, that creature and makes it into a really scary monster. Um, it's just really, really crazy what, what David Cronenberg was able to do with this movie. And in my opinion, he made it better than the original. And I love the original, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that this remake, to me, perfected what the original was trying to do. Now, when it comes to performances, Jeff Goldblum's performance is flawless. He is one of the greatest actors that has ever lived. And this is one of the movies that I say, this is why young people should kind of jump on, you know, film history a little bit. Because... They know Jeff Goldblum, but they know him from, like, Jurassic Park. And they don't realize that he was in way more than Jurassic Park. And he is a horror icon for a reason. Uh, he plays this character very tragic. And you do feel really bad for him because you see that this guy is becoming 
a monster and there's nothing you can really do about it. At the end of the day, it's going to happen and, you know, no spoilers, but he may have to be taken down by the one who loves him the most. And it's really tragic to see. And the beautiful thing about this film is that there is a love story in it, a very strong love story at the center of this film. And you get to see the love start to fall apart because he's becoming something else and he's becoming more psychotic and, and, well, not psychotic, but just his instincts for being a fly creature are, are taking over. And it, it's, it's really tragic. And I love the way this film just, oh, it's just, it's beautiful. David Cronenberg is just, like I said again, he's a master. And I think that this film still stands up to, to, till today. The graphics are amazing. Uh, the horror, like I said, is terrifying. The performance is beautiful. Everything about the film is just a masterpiece. I mean, it's just it's just a masterpiece. And I highly recommend that everybody check it out. Uh, if you've never seen The Fly before, please check it out. This movie needs to be su supported. And this is what people need to watch to see. This is how you make a film. You know what I mean? And yeah, uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, please go check out The Fly. And yeah, thank you so much. Bye-bye. I think another reason why the original does not get much love and respect and attention is because it's overshadowed by the remake with David Cronenberg. This movie is a great example of a good horror remake. I thought David Cronenberg did a great job remaking The Fly, making it his own, and changing it up a little bit. I'll admit, I saw this first before knowing there was an original Fly. I love how we see Jeff Golan become The Fly slowly through phases as a metaphor for old age ten times faster. Not only does he become the fly slowly, the teleportation alters his personality, and he changes as a person. He goes from a nice, quirky guy to a monster. I love the gross-out special effects. In my opinion, I think this is David Cronenberg's masterpiece, but that's just my opinion. I know you'd think that video drama is his masterpiece, Christian, but that's okay. The part when we see him arm-wrestle the guy at the bar and he breaks the man's wrist. After seeing this movie, I haven't arm-wrestled since then. No joke, I refuse to arm-wrestle. Once again, thanks, Christian. So, I hope you enjoyed their takes on this movie. That was my review on The Fly, and my next movie review will be on The Fly 2.